great to be here. So I'm from Waterford, Waterford City originally, uh, up the Daisha. Uh, you're from the Daisha, yeah, Love House. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm in Lismore, La Lismore Lawn. Yeah, the posh part of Lismore Park. You wouldn't know by looking at me. But uh, yeah, it's just so great to be here. Um, great to see the beach machine. And they're down, as long as I remember, down in, in Tremor, which is where my wife and son live. Uh, we love it, tr we, we love Tremor. Um, so very briefly, um, I came to Lord in 2005. Um, what, m what motivated me to go to church is I wanted to escape the hell that was addiction. So I was uh, addicted to alcohol. I tried everything to stop, you name it, I tried it. I went to rehab, uh, yeah, and it just, it did not work for me. And, you know, my brother got saved a couple of years before me. Now, I was very anti-God, anti-Christian. And when he, he, when he got saved, I, I kind of thought, it, for me, it was almost like a loss. I, I disowned my brother. He's a Christian now. That's it. He's finished and he's in a cult, you know, the whole lot. And, um, so yeah, so did you know two years later, I'd be ringing him with a severe hangover. Jimmy, can I go to your mass? That, and uh, yeah, I went along. Uh, my first time in a Christian church was an eye opener. Uh, I can honestly say that I was scared, especially with the worship. And unfortunately, after the first set of worship, I left. I, I, it was just too much for me. But there's one thing that really stood out for me. There was a lady, an African lady, and she was standing up. And you know, I was only used to, to, to Catholic church. I grew up a Catholic. But she was standing up, the worship team, and she had her hands in the air. And I remember looking at her going, she truly believes in the person that she is worshiping. I could see her faith. I could see that it was sincere, that it, that it was genuine. And that stuck with me. And I went back the following Sunday, walked in the door, and a nice old lady came up to me, handed me a Bible. She said, you're more than welcome. She probably looked, I looked absolutely terrified. And she said, read the Gospels. And it was the first time I ever held a Bible. So I asked her, you know, what, what were the Gospels? So she said, she opened it up. She showed me Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read it when you're finished. Go back and read it again. And I did that. And I did that for a number of weeks. And I got to know Jesus. And when you get to know Jesus, you cannot but fall in love with Jesus. And then I gave my life to the Lord. And there was a complete U-turn in how I lived my life. I went from being nearly homeless, having nothing, to being set free. And I remember the Tuesday night I gave my life to the Lord as a worship night in a church called Maranatha. They're still going strong in Waterford today. And I could not put it into words how I felt at that moment of salvation. But I knew I was different. And Paul describes it in Corinthians that, we are a new creation. And that was me. And then very early on, I was actually speaking to, to visitors here this morning. I say within the first six months, I knew that God had a call in my, in my, on my life to, to become a pastor. Now, that was the last thing I ever wanted to do. Um, I, I'm not a fan of responsibility, although I have, I have matured but I was terrified to stand up and, and speak in front of people. But um, I knew God was calling me into it, and I, I just put it to the back of my mind, forgot about it, and hoping that God, somewhere along the line, would forget about that as well. But by 2012, I was uh, ordained a, a pastor in Calvary Chapel of Waterford. Uh, two years later, I became the lead pastor when the founding pastor returned back to California. And I was lead pastor there for seven years. And then last August, um, the Lord called Anna and I out of Calvary Warford Christian Church to plant a church in our hometown of Tremor. So that's what we're doing at the moment. Church plant, we have a Bible study every Tuesday. There is five of us. And we're so excited about it. Um, the, the, it's just great being in God's will, isn't it? 
it's great doing something that you know God has called you to do. Uh, I'm also part of an organization called Christian Surfers. And it's uh, pretty, exp uh, you know, that's it. It's, uh, it. it's reaching the surfing community. And Tremor has a huge surfing community. So um, that's something we, I'm doing as well. That's gonna be my main outreach. So if you guys could keep us in your prayers, we need them. Um, but God is good, isn't he? And it's like just talking about a changed life. And every time I see those red, red shirts from the beach missions, I won't say I feel guilty, but I'm kind of remem I remember past sins. Because as I said, I was very anti-God. And I remember I'd come out from a surf in Tremor pre-2005 BC days. And I'd see the beach missions and I'd get so angry. And I'd look at you guys and I was the one who shouted. And I shouted abuse at him. You know, that was, that was the hatred I had for God and, and Christians. And I'd see people evangelizing in Waterford City. And oh yeah, it was, uh, I didn't like Christians. <laughs> but praise God. He has a sense of humor, doesn't he? He really calls some of the most unlikeliest people you could imagine. And I, I fit into that category. Um, James, book of James. It is, um, I tend to teach a book and go, oh, that's my favorite book. That's my favorite book ever. But then you go to the next one. Oh, that's my favorite. I just love James. It is, it is so straight. It is not complicated at all. So the book of James, it's probably the, the oldest book in the New Testament. And some believe that it could have been written as early as AD 45. And it's generally accepted that it, the letter was written by uh, James, also called James the Just. And he was the half brother of Jesus. And it was written at a time uh, when the church was young. And the people who attended the church at, around this time, they were mainly from a Jewish background. So they were Jewish converts. And if you notice in chapter 1, uh, verse 1, James addresses his letter to the 12 tribes. So here we have the Jewish people in the dispersion. So in New, Testa in New Testament language, the dispersion, it means to scatter abroad. Now you may know from Acts chapter 8, uh, when Stephen was stoned in Jerusalem, the Bible tells us that a great persecution then came upon the church. And a lot of these new believers in Jesus, they fled, they, 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 they got out of Jerusalem and they made their way north to an area that is called, and we see it in the Bible, Asia Minor, which would be modern day northern Turkey. So as I said, he is writing to Jewish believers um, who have been scattered among Gentile nations. They had been driven from their homes, they had very little, and they found themselves in this alien culture, this pagan culture. And they were really, really struggling to live out what they believed. Which is why James opens his letter by encouraging them to continue growing in the faith. In chapter one, uh, verses nine to 11, he urges them to continue to believe and trust in God. They're, it's very much, look, times are tough, don't give up. And then he also tells them, if you look at verse 22, this is one to underline of chapter one. He tells them that they ought to be doers of the word and not just hearers. Because hearing and talking about God's word, it wasn't enough. They had to live it out in their day the day lives. And then in chapter two, he builds upon this premise and he addresses specific problems, issues that were present at the church at this time. And these problems are still with us today. So in verses one to 13, he begins his list by addressing the sin of partiality. Now, partiality is a bias for a person or group of people. It's favoritism. It's also a bias against a person or people, and it's called prejudice. 
So whether it is based on our e an individual's economic status, race, culture, or anything else, partiality, bias, is contrary to the love of God. It, it's sinful. And now, starting in verse 14, he encourages them to demonstrate their faith by their actions. Because remember, they're in a foreign country, a foreign land. They're among pagans. And they're kind of saying, well, I'm going to keep my head down, keep my mouth shut, say nothing. I'm not going to pop up on the radar. And James is saying, no, lads, you don't do that. That's not what you're called to do. Because genuine faith in Christ brings about real change in how you and I live our lives. So verse 14, our first verse this morning. So James asks, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Now, what's really important here to notice is that James isn't speaking about an individual who has faith, someone who has saving faith, but someone who claims to be a Christian. So can someone say, I am a believer in Jesus, while at the same time live a life that is completely, continually disobedient to God's word? So can a saving faith exist without producing accompanying works? That's the question that James is asking here. And of course, the answer is no. Now, for me, when I got saved, it was, I went from being this person to that person. There was a huge change. It was, you could not miss it. But for some people, it's not as no noticeable, but it should still be there. You know, I know a lot of people who got saved and they were living really good moral lives. And do you ever meet someone who's not a believer and you're going, they should be a Christian. Look how they're living their lives. They're so friendly. They're, they're very charitable. You know, they're, they, they, they put us to shame. Thank God we're saved by grace, isn't it? You know, genuine faith in Christ results in a changed life because we're a new creation, aren't we? 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And I felt that when I got saved. You know, I, I didn't know this verse existed because I didn't really know much of the Bible. But, um, yeah, it, it's impossible for God to come into your life and for that life to stay the change, to stay the same. You know, by its very nature, this new life, as you're a new creation, it will result in good works. It will. But like today, the early church had individuals who claimed to be Christians. So they profess to be followers of Christ. But where's the evidence? And that's what Paul, that's what James is saying here, which is why he now gives a very simple illustration. Verse 15. So, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food. So, here he's describing the poorest of the poor, someone who is coming to the church and they lack the basic necessities of life. And one of you, verse 16, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them things needed for the body. What good is that? So this quote from James, go in peace, be warmed and filled, this is, this is probably a saying back in these days, almost like a, a, a greeting. And even though these people, they did express concern for the well-being of this needy person, that's as far as it went. If they truly cared for this individual, they would have done something themselves to help them, wouldn't they? So their grandiose spiritual words were absolutely meaningless, empty faith, because it was not backed up with their actions. 
that Jesus declared in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. He said, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. I'm still waiting for a drill to come back to me after five years. I give, oh, what do you miss? <laughs> Paul told the Romans, chapter 12, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So there's a big difference, and this is the point James is making, in saying something spiritual and actually doing something, something practical to help. And the apostle John deals with this kind of false profession throughout his, throughout his first letter. In 1 John three sixteen to 19, he says, By this we know love, that he, so he's speaking about Jesus, he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And then he says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are, the, we are of the truth and reserve, reassure our hearts before him. So if someone is in need of food, shelter, clothing, especially fellow believers, it is our responsibility as their brothers and sisters to make sure that that individual is taken care of. When that type of love is evident within the body of Christ, when you and I love not just in word but in deed, when we share our resources with others, it's proof that God is truly living within us. Which in turn, as John tells us, it reassures our hearts. Because it, such acts, actions, there, it is evidence that we are part of God's family and we take care of God's family. So real love, real faith produces, and here's the word, selfless, sacrificial service. You know, Jesus, he didn't just talk about his love for us, did he? He proved it by going to the cross. The cross was love in action. Now, there's an important word here that, again, I don't want us to miss. Look at verse 16. Giving them the things needed. So James isn't telling us that we should give everything we own to the poor or to those in need in the church. Because what would happen? We'd only end up being in the same situation that they're in. Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians, and it is my prayer that, you lo that your love may abound more and more. Now here we go, listen to this. With knowledge and all discernment. Love, as Paul tells the Philippians, must have an element of knowledge and discernment because he understood that the dangers, the, the error of, of undiscerning love. And we must as well. You know, we're certainly not called to give to somebody if we know that what we give is going to cause that person to sin or to, to further destroy their, their lives. Now, over the years, I've had a number of people call to the, the church offices when I was pastor in Calvary Waterford, and we helped where we could. And there's one guy, I just have this memory, it just sticks in my brain because it's just, it's so, so sad. So I had a guy called to the, called to the office, and um, he, he, he asked for some money for food. And I said, look, absolutely going to help you, but it's a policy in the church that we don't give cash. But if you want to hang on here or come back in 20 minutes, I can go to Super Value, get, yourself, get you a voucher, and I can give you that. But he wasn't interested. And I could see that he was, he, he was struggling, you know. And then he said, oh, no, I need cash because, you know, I miss me rent. The landlord's going to throw me out. And so, look, I offered, look, I'm happy to ring your landlord and come to some kind of arrangement. We could so sort something out. 
But look, he, he refused. And he said, look, I just want cash. And as I said, you could see that the guy was in addiction. You know, I, I could recognize it. So in, in an attempt to try and find some common ground with this man, I shared how, how I was an alcoholic, how I was borderline homeless. You know, um, if it wasn't for family, I would have been, I would have been homeless. And, um, you know, I offered to help. I said, look, I can, we can ring some people. We can, you know, we can, we can do something. Your situation isn't homeless. I said, Jesus transformed my life and he can do it to you. And he just looked at me and I just still see his face today. And he said, no, but thanks anyway. And he just turned and walked away. And I pray for that guy regularly. So look, there has to be an element of knowledge and discernment. Because look, if I, was, if I was to give him cash, I kind of know what he was going to spend the money on. Because true love, it always does what's best for the other person, doesn't it? Love doesn't always say yes. Sometimes it's, it's tough love. Love isn't blind. It discerns. It looks beneath the surface. And it tries to determine the consequences of our actions. So we need wisdom. And James said back in chapter 1, if you need wisdom, you know where you can find it. Go to God and ask. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. So he continues in verse 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, this is kind of a controversial verse. Is James contradicting the Apostle Paul's teaching when it comes to salvation? Listen to what Paul told the Romans, Romans 3, 28. For you hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Okay? Now, it's crucial that we examine these statements in context. And context is so important in biblical interpretation. So when Paul speaks of works, He's speaking about the works of the law, the Ten Commandments, and everything that went with that. So he's pointing at those within the church who, instead of trusting in Jesus alone for their salvation, they were adding on. They were adding on the Ten Commandments. They were adding on circumcision. And they were telling people, well, you've got to, be, you've got to convert to Judaism before you become a Christian, and then you've got to go get circumcised. And Paul is saying, no. James, on the other hand, was concerned with people who claimed to be Christians, but there was no evidence, none whatsoever. They were still living the same old life. There were no acts of loving service or obedience to God's word. So James, by no means, is contradicting Paul. You see, true faith in Christ produces good fruit. And Jesus spoke about that a lot, didn't he? Therefore, your works will either confirm or deny your faith. That said, we don't always get it right. We don't. And even though our salvation is not in any way, shape, or form dependent on good deeds or keeping rules or regulations, there should be evidence. Paul told the Ephesians, Ephesians 2 8, for by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So it's nothing to do with works. I really like how David Guzak put it. David Guzak is a, a Calvary Chapel pastor, and he's one, one of my favorite teachers. He said, to speak technically, we are not saved by faith. We are saved by God's grace. And grace is appro uh, appropriated by faith. In other words, faith activates God's saving grace. So Paul is clear. Faith is the basis 
of salvation apart from works, which means that God's grace is available to everybody. What a beautiful message. Everybody. You know, I'm shocked that God called me. I'm absolutely shocked. You know, when I think of the stuff I got up to in drink, uh, the last time I ended in court, the judge promised, Mr. Pear, if I see you again, you're going to jail. Um, that was my lifestyle. I was extremely violent. I had a very quick temper. Um, I had extreme right-wing views uh, to such an extent. I hate sharing this. But um, yeah, I actually had a swastika tattooed on my shoulder. That's how far gone I was. But yet God, the God of the Jewish people, called out to me. Incredible. What grace. If I was God, I wouldn't have called out him. Are you kidding me? Nobody is too far gone. Absolutely nobody. And when I say to you, if you're praying for someone today, keep praying. Don't give up. People, even my brother James told me, oh, I thought you were just a hopeless case. You know, it was over a matter of time before I was in jail or dead. Seriously. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Beautiful. It's an absolute guarantee. So to believe in the heart means that you are convinced. So it's more than just some kind of intellectual understanding because you can understand something and still not believe in it. So the first thing that you must do in order to be, to be saved is to believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Convinced that he died and rose again. And you might not completely understand it. You might not. John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So if you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, he will give you the right to become a child of God. Evidence of which will be seen in how you live your life which is the very point that James is making here. And James is not doing this out of spite. James, this isn't a witch hunt. James is looking at these churches and he says, look, I know there's people there who think they're Christian, they're not, because they're living the same way they always have. I need to get through to these people. They need to wake up. And then in verse 18, here comes the excuses. And James he anticipates the, their argument. Look at verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. So some people in this church were saying, well, look, you have the gift of faith, that's great for you. I have the gift of works. And let's just leave it like that. So the guys who had the gift of faith, they didn't have to do works. They could just sit back and relax. There was, there was no change in their life. But James, he wants to see the evidence of salvation. Verse 18, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. What a statement. Because my faith, it is invisible until it is demonstrated by my actions. You know, I could go to work, you could work in the same company for 10 years, and people would not know that you're a believer. Say nothing, keep your head down, don't cause any controversy. Genuine faith will be seen. And look, sometimes, guys, these good works, they come at very inconvenient times. And it's sacrificial love. Just to give you a really just off-the-cuff example, um, I went to do the weekly shopping in Lidl um, a couple of weeks ago. And what drives me nuts, and there's a lot of things that drive me nuts. I'm a grumpy man. What drives me nuts is the two euro coin for the shopping trolley. Okay? I never have it. 
So I wrote it down on my phone as a reminder, find, find two euros, pull it in your wallet and never take it out, never spend it. So I did that. For two weeks it worked absolutely fantastic. Um, so I put all the shopping in my car, went back to put the trolley in the stand, and this little old lady came up to me. And she said, look, uh, can I take your two euro coin? And my first reaction is, the cheek of her. <laughs> Does she know the hassle I've gone through? Of course, I had to give it to her. Because, yeah, it was, it would have been rude, wouldn't it? But it was very inconvenient for me to part with that two euros. I handed her the two euros, she gave me back a fist for the shrapnel. Like five cent coins, and I walked away. And I was kind of, And then I remembered this in James, which is why I'm teaching it today. You know, good works. And I had to correct my heart attitude. And that's it. It's simple things. It's day-to-day -day living. It's waking up and saying, Lord, give me the opportunity to be a blessing to somebody. And now James, he brings up this idea about demons. And you might think it a bit strange, but yeah, it's really cool. Verse 19, he said, you believe that God is one, you do well. So as I mentioned in my introduction, um, this letter was written to at a time when the church mainly consisted of Jewish believers, believers from a Jewish background. And they would have been very familiar with this with this. Uh, that with this statement that God is one. Because it begins the most important and familiar uh, prayer in Judaism. Now, I hope I pronounce it right. Uh, it's called the Shemar. Yeah. Okay, thank God. Um, and Jews, they would recite it daily. And practicing Jews today still do it. And... The first verse of this prayer is found in Deuteronomy 6, 4. And then it says, Hear, O Israel, and then this is what James quotes, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So these people would have grown up agreeing with this truth. And then James says, But even demons believe, and they shudder. So what's he saying? You can know everything the Bible has to say about God and salvation and still go to hell. That's, that's heavy, isn't it? After all, as James says, the devil believes in God and so do the demons. So the point he's making is that there's a big difference between knowing about God and putting your trust in him. Intellect alone, it is, it's not enough. You know, as you can know the Bible, you can know it inside out and still not have saving faith. How tragic is that? And now in verses 20 to 24, James makes it absolutely clear that he isn't teaching salvation by works. Okay? Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, verse 20, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, and now he quotes from Genesis 15, verse 6, which describes how Abraham was saved. Abraham believed God. There you go, faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. So apart from Moses, no other character is mentioned more often in the New Testament than Abraham. And James reminds them how Abraham was justified long before he even offered his son Isaac. In fact, this was 400 years before the law was given to the Israelites. It was before Abraham was even circumcised. So neither the law 
nor circumcision made him right with God. What, what made him right with God? Faith. He believed. Abraham was declared righteous because he believed and he trusted in God. Hebrews 11.8 describes how by faith Abraham obeyed. So he obeyed to leave his homeland and travel to a place that he was received, that he would, was to receive as an inheritance. And then Hebrews 11.17 adds, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. So by offering up his son to God, he showed that his faith was real, that it was genuine. And then in verse 19 of Hebrews, it describes how Abraham believed that if, if, if Isaac was sacrificed, that God had the power to raise him to life again. That's faith, isn't it? In fact, all through Hebrews 11, we read about the heroes of faith and what they did. So by faith, Abel, he offered a better sacrifice than his brother. By faith, Enoch was taken up. By faith, Noah built the ark when everybody ridiculed him. And all through the chapter in Hebrews, we see how faith was lived out in people's lives. Again, the point that James is making here. Without action, without works, our faith is just words. It's all it is. And notice how he refers to Abram, Abraham as a friend of God. We had it in the worship song earlier. We're, we are friends of God, friends of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples in John 15. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. So in those days, disciples of rabbis were, were considered his servants. And likewise, the master of a household, if he gave direction to his servants, he would expect the work to be done. But Jesus, he changes that relationship by calling us his, his followers, his friends. And yes, there is work to be done for God, isn't there? But from Jesus' viewpoint, we are partners with him in that work. It's beautiful. He's with us every step of the way. Every step of the way. And then James declares in verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, when he says faith alone here, he's speaking about faith that is dead. Faith by words only. So there's no works, there's no evidence. And as I said, true life, it, true faith, it changes. It changes how we live on a day-to-day -day basis. It's seen with how we love each other as believers. And it's seen how we love everybody else. Love your enemies, pray for them. Ooh, do you do that? It's a tough one. It's not easy. And there James, he goes to the other end of the spectrum. So you have Abraham up there who is absolutely loved and adored by the Jewish people. And now he picks a, a, a Gentile, pagan foreigner who worked as a prostitute. Again, God's grace. And he used her as an example of a living faith. A woman who proved her faith be genuine by what she did. Look at verse 25. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. So, Rahab's story is found in the book of Joshua. So the Israelites were about to enter into the promised land. The first obstacle was this walled city called Jericho. So in, you know, with a bit of cop on, as we say in Waterford, they sent in a couple of spies just to see what they were up against. But when the spies got into the city, they realized they were, they were, that 
they were being searched out. So the plan was a failure. So they bump into Rahab, and she tells them that, look, you guys, you're in trouble. You know, the king's men are out to get you. They know you're here. And before she helped them to escape, she told them how the whole city had heard how God had delivered Israel from Egypt. And she added, Joshua 2.11, For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on earth beneath. So right there, she had put her faith in God. And that faith was demonstrated in her willingness to help the two spies. So it wasn't all talk. So at great risk to herself and her family, she helped the two men escape the city. So again, her faith wasn't just empty words. Her good works proved her faith in God was genuine. So I'm nearly done. So James now, he cements his argument by way of using another illustration. Verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So if, if a body isn't breathing, I think it's safe to say that it's, that it's dead. Just as a person without the Holy Spirit is spiritually dead. So James, he's warning us not to trust in a salvation that isn't also marked by a life of obedience. Now look, not perfection. Okay, not perfection. All have sinned and, and fall short of the glory of God. We make mistakes. But obedience and growth in the word of God should be seen in our lives. Now, so the question is, and I'll, this is my conclusion, do my actions always mirror the faith I proclaim? Now, if you struggle to answer that question, believe me, look around, you're, you are in good company. You know, and I would absolutely love to stand up here and tell you that my faith and, and my works have always gone hand in hand, but that's not the case. And James does recognize that we as believers struggle. And that's why he says in chapter 3, verse 2, he says that you're going to struggle in many ways, but trust in God, lean on him, rely on his grace and mercy to live out what Jesus has called you to do. You see, for James, faith should affect our day-to-day -day lives and within the context of his letter in how we handle hard times. Faith, it seeks God's wisdom, chapter one. It helps those in need, chapter two. It doesn't show favoritism. Faith affects our day-to-day -day interactions with other people. And remember, God doesn't expect you to do it in your own strength, but through and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he wants to empower us, each and every one of us here this morning so that you can live a life that brings him all the glory and in that way to bring people to him. Amen? So the second set of worship. Yeah, so as the worship team comes up, um, I'm going to pray. And I uh, just want to thank, thank the elders for the invite. It's been gr so cool. I think it's eight years since I last taught in, here in La Hinch. Uh, <coughs> sorry, Anna Steiner. I get beaten up at the door. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, for your incredible grace. Lord, I, I understand the theology, but it's hard to comprehend how much you truly love us, Lord. You love us so much that you took our sins upon us and you went to the cross, that, that horrific death. That's the extent of your love for us. And Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, fill us so that we may live a life that glorifies our Father in heaven that we may love one another in a way that people sit up and take notice, Lord. Help us, Lord, in our day-to-day -day walk to live a life that glorifies you. And I thank you for each and every person here this morning, Lord. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.